This episode is sponsored by Days of Wonder. Episode 36 of the Board Game Geek Podcast, where we geek out about board games, the mechanisms behind them, and the people who create them. I'm your host, Candace Harris, and I am so excited to be here today with Stella from Meeple University, which is an awesome YouTube channel primarily focused on how to play and entertainment videos for a variety of different types of board games. How's it going today, Stella? Very, very good. Hi, <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I'm yes. <laughs> just, I'm just so happy to be here. I just got back from a board game convention in Australia called CanCon. Oh, cool. Any any highlights from CanCon? Well, there's lots of highlights, but unfortunately, I didn't get to bump into you this time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Stella and I have this crazy like connection, cosmic connection oh, where yeah. we're whenever we're at a convention together. This has happened like two or three times at this point. We I feel just, like it's more. I know. I know. <laughs> it's because we bump into each other yeah. so much. And so it's much. like there will be other people we know, like content creators, game designers, and just people yeah. we know. But I'm like, I always see Stella. It's like, oh, walk around the corner tomorrow, see Stella, see Stella. And it's just, it's the funniest thing. And it's always like exciting. And you're always such a delight to talk to. And that's why I'm really excited to have you here today. Oh my God, so do I. It's like, it's not even on board game convention, but at the train <laughs> station at Essen. Like seriously. Yes! <laughs> even at, at the, the train hotel station. At Gen Con. At the hotel <laughs> at Gen Con. It's like just everywhere. Uh, I swear yes. I'm not following you. I'm not stalking you. Did same, you? Same, Stella. Same, no, no, same, okay. same, same. same thing here the universe is just <laughs> bumping us into each other yes. but yeah i am i'm really really glad to have you here today and i think this is the first bgg podcast episode where i'm talking to someone super far in the future because it's wednesday for you right Yes, it is Wednesday afternoon at 10 ish in the afternoon. And don't ask me what the lottery number is going to win. Because <laughs> if I knew, then I would have been a millionaire, but I don't. And, and, st <laughs> and Stella, where are you? Where are you located again? I am in Melbourne. Uh, we say okay. it Melbourne. You call it Melbourne. Victoria, <laughs> Australia. <Melbourne. laughs> yes. Australia. Yes. I need to get out there at some point. I really do. I was actually just talking to mm -hmm. um, Amy and Maggie from Thinker Themer and I'm like, I need oh, to get to Japan, but they're, but they're like, you should also just make a trip out this way while you're already all the way out in Japan. So <laughs> yeah, for sure. How exciting. Oh, uh, the spiders are the myth, by the way. Um, they are oh. just a myth. So don't worry. Don't be scared of them. I don't even, I've never even heard this about <laughs> spiders, but now I'm like, you need to tell me more about this because I am someone who does not like spiders. Oh, no, you have, like, I'm, I'm joking. like giant spiders? They're giant, well, they have giant spiders. So uh, uh, <laughs> our last encounter was at CanCon, Taren was driving, and then all of oh. a sudden he swerved to the side. Oh. I was like, what is going on? And then this just giant fight spider on the top of the roof crawling. Oh, I was like, oh, oh my God. God. <laughs> I'm um, pretty sure it's just huntsmen, which is fine. They're big, but they're like not going to kill you. Yeah, they're not going to kill you. And wow. finally, yeah, I just like grab a plastic bag and then grab the spider and then just crunch it on my what, hand Ooh. because, I mean, I'm sorry, spiders lovers. Um, but, you know, I want to make sure that we are driving safely. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I'll make That's sure insane. you're driving with me if I'm ever driving in Australia. <laughs> it's I crunch actually... the spider. <laughs> I actually do. At some point, I, you know, years ago, I had a sunroof on my car and I was, it was summertime and I was living in Pennsylvania and I left the sunroof open while I went in the store. Maybe there was a tree above. When I got back in the car, I'm driving and a spider drops down, terrifies me. And I, thankfully I didn't like get into an accident or anything, but I did like now I have a whole like kind of OCD thing where when I get in the car, I always put the uh, visor down and just like oh, yeah. check above me to make sure there are no spiders like just 
waiting to oh. drop down as I'm driving. Oh my god, that, that is, is so a scary. safety life no. tip for everybody. Yes, check, yes. Check those visors, especially if you are going to Australia <laughs> <laughs> with the with the big spiders. Oh yes. my goodness. Oh my goodness. Uh, thank you for that warning. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Hopefully it will never ever happen to anyone. But that was just a one time only. I'm like, I'm in Australia for years and years. Heron does. That's the first time that happened to us. So, okay. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, it's, it's not That's very often. That's good to know. That's reassuring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, today we're, we're doing a designer spotlight on Alexander Pfister. So, we're <sighs> going to discuss our favorite Alexander Pfister games and just what makes his games special and unique. You know, I, I don't know about you, Stella, but like I haven't played every single Alexander Pfister no. game. Yep. But I do consider him to be one of my favorite game designers because there are just like a couple of his games that I absolutely love and like consider to be some of my all time favorites. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. I mean, he designed a few different games that are, uh, you know, Great Western Trailies once, Sky yep. Mines, and then there's also Oh My Goods and Broom Surface, which is. Yeah, lighter. lighter. Uh, yeah, lighter and different. <laughs> lighter yes, and different. Very different. Very different. Yep. He's so lovely as well. He's, he's very friendly. He likes to comment to people's comments on BGG, on our videos. Yes. It's like the first time we did. Great Western Trail video. We were like nobody. We had like maybe 50 subscribers in our channels. Oh. And he was just like, he came there and he just put a comment. Great video. And I was like, oh. the first time I saw it, I was like, oh my God, Taryn, look, look, oh my God, Alex, Alex. Yeah. Oh my God. I was just like really like a, like a fangirl crazy. <laughs> I I know that feeling because I think like Alexander Fister has commented on some of like my BGG news articles <gasps> and maybe like tweeted something or retweeted and I, I I think the first time it happened I took a screenshot because uh I, like one yep. of my friends Hector and I we call ourselves Fister fans Fister fans for life <laughs> and uh so I I geeked out too I'm a big, big oh my Alexander gosh. Fister fan girl here. <laughs> <laughs> same, same. And you know what? He obviously, you know, he's, he's like to make an effort and he even came to our, one of our videos for Christmas holiday season video oh, and then he was singing. Oh. It was just, <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. It's like, it's so lovely. Oh. So sweet. So yes. That is that is that is so awesome, but I need to go like dig up that video. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, maybe only twenty percent of the people in that video can actually sing, including myself. <laughs> I can't sing, <laughs> but it's just fun to you know have board game. We don't ha we haven't done that uh, those type of videos anymore. Maybe one day, but yeah, okay. it's it right. great to have him then. Cool, that's <laughs> awesome. Well, so before we start talking about Alexander Fister games. I'd love to hear what you've been playing lately. So let's jump into Fresh Plays. Well, I have been to CanCon where I yeah. played some games. <laughs> and I think... And there are a few that we play, but the first one was Wormspan. So Ooh. the spiritual successors of Wor Wingspan. Oh my God, Wormspan, Wingspan. And <laughs> that was released in 2024. And the designer is Connie Fogelman, which designed one of our top games of 2023, Apiary. Yeah. And Wormspan is developed by Elizabeth. Hargrave, which is the designer of Wingspan, uh, published by Stonemaier Games. So the game plays one to five players. And I've tried different play accounts, and I love it. Cool. So we received Wormspan early copy from Jamie, and we have actually been commissioned to do a how-to-play video on Wormspan. Cool. But this is definitely just my opinion on the game. Right. Cool. So you are dracologist. Is that how you say dracologist? You are trying to prepare your cave, like excavate, excavate your cave, and try to entice dragons to come. And mm -hmm. you, it, it feels like probably I don't know sixty percent like wingsman, okay. but the resources are very tight, and they are obviously the dragon. 
There are similarities like caching the eggs, tucking, it's the same. But yeah, it's like a step up from wingspan. In terms so, of like complexity? Complexity, yeah, complexity. More, more into it, okay. Yeah, I, lo- I love dragons. I, lo- I mean, I love birds. But dragons, I'm more of a fantasy girl. So dragons yeah. like, oh, dragons, hey! <laughs> so uh, complexity is higher up. And just a different way of putting the dragons in the cave. Like you have to excavate the cave first. It's not automatically available for you to put it in the in the cave. Oh, so you can't just like play a dragon to your player board? You have to like clear a space or something? Correct, correct. So you oh, need to okay. put the cave card underneath your dragon. Oh. Um, and the cave card is actually one of the good ways to get resources to afford to play the dragon, which cool. is which is thematic, right? You excavate and then you just get these resources from like digging on the cave and then makes yeah. the cave is available for the dragon. One thing that I love about Wormspan, and this is if you play Wingspan a lot, you would remember the action points that you have. They are dwindling towards the oh, end yeah, of the yeah. game, right? Like right. you play and then you use that token to put it on the end of round objectives. Right. Uh, although you have less actions, but your actions are more powerful. Well, in Wormspan, you not you it's not dwindling. You put another tokens for the end round objective, so you have a separate tokens. So it's not eating out your action point allowance, which is six. But there are options to actually add those tokens. So for for those like to engine build to do more things, and Ooh. it's there. It's it's very interesting, right? It's a form of coin. I call it dragon scale. It looks like a dragon scale. Um, <laughs> cool. Awesome. It's very, um, it, yeah, it's, it's different. And the thing is, yes, it, you have a lot more maybe of things you can do or you can just combo more things, but it doesn't feel easy as well. Like it doesn't make the games easy. Like you would think uh. that easy, like, you know, make it too easy to achieve anything. No, no, it's not. Uh, they are dragons for example also on the other side on the flip side there are dragons that you can play but you have to pay the coin so not only you pay that to do the action but you have to discard one which you will get again next round by the way Uh, but you have to discard it to play that really powerful dragon so let's just play with the action point tokens yeah action point because the game is mainly basing based on action point allowance right you just spend this on this and then you, right. you do the action so and then at the end of each track you know where wingspan has got three rows of things that you can fill up birds and then now dragons at the end of it you have the options to give up some resources for extra action point tokens cool so cool. that makes it like the dynamics different yes it has still wingspan filling but those little things just enough to make it a different game, which we're probably going to talk about the Great Western Trail, you know, the other <laughs> edition, these little yeah. things that makes it different. But this is basically almost like that, like things oh, cool. that makes it like different game. Which is great, right? Like that's, yeah. like, that's great because yes. you have some familiarity of what you love, but you have a different game yeah. to play, I- to enjoy. And there's still end of round objectives. There are no private objectives anymore. Okay. So now okay. it's competitive dragon guild that you can move your meeple around the track and then gain bonuses and then also gaining end games scoring and so on. It's it's really fun. It's cool. I th- I think maybe I like it better than wingspan. Okay. That's All a big right. statement. I mean, um, maybe not. <laughs> I'm sure you get to, to play. Say? Yeah, yeah. Too soon to say. You, you have yeah. played it or you will play it soon? I, I haven't I haven't <laughs> played it yet, so I'm actually excited that you brought this one up because I've I've been um curious about it. So I actually I just actually played Apiary for the first time a couple weeks ago. <gasps> and uh I was interviewing Connie Vogelman for an episode of Cardboard Creations that's gonna be out on February seventh. Um, so, so short, shortly, 
But uh, and it's cool because she does talk about Wormspan a little bit. And I just think, you know, I'm really excited to try Wormspan because I haven't played Wingspan in a while, but like I played it a lot when it when it came out and I really like it. And, you know, especially for that yeah. weight, weight of game and for what it does to like bringing people into the hobby and everything. And the yeah. art is just gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, I'm very excited to see the dragon cards and everything. But I'm also just like really stoked that Connie just kind of popped out of the woodworks here with Apiary. And then it's like, what, less than six months later, she has a second game coming out. So really exciting. Like I, I'm, I'm liking the theming on these. I'm liking seeing more female designers getting out there. Oh, yeah. And I like that it's like a little more complex, too. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. It's, I'm sure this is how it works right behind the screen. I mean, the things that we don't see, the thing that they've been working on for years, it'd be like they've been working on a few games, must be the last few years, and then just like popped up. It yeah. seems like it's out of nothing, but really they work on it. Oh, for yeah, so yeah. Long. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. These games do not just you know, pop out. <laughs> but I know what you mean. Air. Yeah. yeah. It, it feels like that. Oh, where does Connie came from? Like, it, it's apiary. It's, it's great. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. We yeah. played that. We play that last um, the last game we play in 2023. It was waiting for the year 10, 2024. We play Apiary. Oh, cool! <laughs> oh, very, very cool. Yes, awesome, awesome. Yeah, well, I am looking forward to checking out Wormspan and just like you know, seeing <laughs> maybe in six months we'll hear about another Connie Vogelman game that's about to drop. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that is Wormspan. How about you? What did you play? What's your fresh play? So, so one of my fresh plays is a game that I um, I actually got handed a prototype. I got handed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Jess, Jess Cassidy, when I bumped into her at PAX Unplugged, she was carrying a copy of PAX Illuminatin and said, would you like to check this out? And I am somebody who, who is a fan of PAX games in general. Mm. And I remember it coming... Or like it, like it going to crowdfunding and like kind of hearing about it. But I um, just because you know there's so so many different games that are coming out all the time. I didn't really like know all that much about it. So I was happy to you know that she passed me a prototype of it. And one of the first surprises with this game is that it's it's a really small box. I don't know why, but when I was seeing it you know, hearing about it on the internet and everything, I was thinking it was like one of those just like 12 by 12, you know, standard game boxes, but it's smaller than that. It's um, kind of How a small? unique size. Um, I'm looking at your tape measure. Uh, I am small, a, little, a little smaller than that. It's like, it's like about this big. Nobody oh, can see wow. this, of course, but it's, it's because it's cards, right? So the, like, the whole game is like kind of <laughs> six, six inches. Maybe Still I'm has just like, tape I'm measure out right now. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll just say it's small. It, it's not like it's not the size of uh, like Watergate. It's a little bit smaller and a little bit chunkier than wow. the size of Watergate. Oh, wait, Gen I have it right. Oh, general orders, maybe ah. it's this size. All right. Oh, 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 so maybe it's like maybe eight inches by eight inches, something like that. Yeah, yeah, or maybe seven. not even eight, maybe not even eight. seven. But it's just yeah. smaller than yes. I was expecting, and <laughs> that was small. that was a that was a pleasant surprise. But this is uh, Pax Illuminatin is a 2024 release, it's not out yet, but it's it'll be out like later this year. It's designed by Oliver Kiley and it's published by Ion Game Design plays with one to four players. And this game takes place in Bavaria in 1776 when the Holy Roman Empire was pretty much running the show and trying to shut down the spread of Enlightenment error thoughts and ideas and everything. Oh. And people who were trying to undermine the Holy Roman Empire's authority had to kind of like do it secretly. So there's this professor um, named Adam Weishaupt who basically wanted to mold Bavaria to the ideals of enlightenment. He formed this secret society called the Order of the Illuminati and was trying to basically make his vision a reality. So first off, off the bat, like I, that, I think that's an interesting part of history that I didn't really yeah. know anything about. So I was like, that's kind of No, neat. no, I was like mesmerized by that. Keep going. Yeah, <laughs> keep going. Uh, so in the game, 
basically each player is taking on the role of one of Adam Weistop's top ranking students. So that's what you are in the game. And we're tasked with accomplishing a series of recruitment plots to basically grow the web of sympathizers for this, this group and their beliefs and everything. So in the game, you're going to be competing to gain influence with other members, and you're basically trying to complete these plots. So really, your goal of the game is to be the first player to complete two plots. And I'll explain like what the plots are in a bit after I tell you a little bit more about the like the look and feel of this game. So the game board is a display of these luminary cards. So the, a lot of this game is driven by cards and the bulk of the cards are these luminary cards. So your board is a modular map setup of cards face down. I think it depends on player count, you know, which how many cards are out and, you know, what that that display of cards looks like, but they all start face down. And then you have a hand of luminary cards. So um, on these luminary cards, they have a rank, I think one to three, but then there's a special like ace and a crown rank. They'll have a name. They'll have some historical notes. Uh, Each luminary character is associated with uh, a number of factions. And these factions, like there's six different factions and they all correspond to the six resources in the game, which in the game resources are favor. And then on each card, there are also a number of spaces where you'll be able to place your influence discs out on by paying an amount of resources that are associated with that potential luminary. And there are a couple other things on them because these are multi-use cards. You're going to be doing a lot with these cards in the game. So as you play the game, you're going to be interacting with this map or this like central display of cards. And those plot cards I was talking about they are going to be objectives that are like, hey, have a path of your influence on maybe a certain type of faction or in a certain orientation, like from the top of the board to the bottom of the board, you need to have a connection of, you know, your influence. So so everybody's kind of like this, this central board is like core to everybody. And with the plot cards, there are two plot cards that are going to be public that are face up and any player can try to claim those plots and multiple players can claim the same plot. But everybody also gets a secret plot that's in their hand. And remember, you need two plots to win the game. So maybe you get a public one and then you surprise your opponents later and say, ha ha, I fulfilled my secret one. I love that kind of stuff in games. So that's that's exciting to me. (laughs) (laughs) But you have a uh, you have a player board that sits uh, at the edge of the map closest to you. And that's kind of like representing your starting influence because when you build out influence, you're going to be doing stuff on the map, but it always starts from your kind of like end of the board. And the player board is awesome because it also has all of the actions summarized to the point where I was playing with experienced, like two friends who are experienced gamers and experienced PAX gamers. They played other like Pax Premier and um, possibly Pax Renaissance. I know at least one of them had, but yep. but they almost were like, you don't need to do a teach because like we could just read these six actions. Like everything was kind of really well called out and summarized. That wow. I didn't even need to do a full teach, which was nice. It was like, hey, here's high level. Here's the goal. This is what you're looking at. Let's go. And it, it, it worked out great. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, that but, sounds really easy because like yeah. a lot of taxes are really heavy and then the rule book is like one inch thick, maybe not one inch. But yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. Yeah. And I and I will say too, the um the designer has a video out where he does a tabletop simulator like explanation of the rules. I would say it's definitely like not going to be that easy if you've never played a PAX game or you're not used yeah. to playing medium or heavy games, you know. <laughs> it'll take some some getting used to, but like for us, it was like, we kind of jumped in fast, which was nice. Oh yeah. But yeah. So the, the resources and the factions are nobility, professions, magistrates, artists, scholars, clergy. Uh, They all have like a different icon and a color associated with them. And then most of the actions are like really straightforward. And most of them you'll be like spending resources based on either the card that you're kind of starting from on the board or the one that you're doing something 
with, but like there's a scout action that lets you reveal cards on the map. And the thing is with the scout action, it's kind of sneaky because remember I said the game board, all of the cards are face down initially. So my first scout, I'm going to pay a resource from my starting board and then I'm going to pick up that card that I'm going to be revealing because... I take it into my hand and then I put a card from my hand onto the board. So it doesn't necessarily need to be the one that was there. I could like kind of take that card up and then put a different one out. But you're kind of like revealing a card on the board and starting the map, you know, it's kind of, I like, I like how it works out where it doesn't start with every card flipped up. And also, yeah, yeah, yeah. And also (laughs) your, your opponents don't know what you're picking up or whether or not you're playing the same card right back down, or if you're playing something else from your hand because you're trying to like set up a combo in your hand. So I thought that was cool. I like that mystery sort of thing. And then it's not, things not overloading at the start. Yeah, and yeah. It's, I, you made me want to play this game, so. Already. I, Hopefully, I yeah. Haven't even, I haven't even gotten to the good parts yet. <laughs> oh, 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 is it? <laughs> What's no, the good no. part? <laughs> <laughs> it is pretty cool, but like other things you can do on your turn, like you can, influence so like once cards are revealed you can pay resources to put a disc out and the depending on the rank of the card like if a card is ranked two it's going to have two slots on it that you could potentially place up to two influence stella you could have one influence on a card and i could have another there are all sorts of things you can do there's like an action where you can expel a card and swap it on the board there's a an action called extort where you can just gain resources from somewhere where you have influence but like, ultimately, everything you're doing is to try to set up to score these plot cards. Very interactive. Yes, very interactive. And it's also one of those games where as, as the cards on the map get revealed and you start seeing your opponents putting influence, you know, you have to be kind of clever about especially the public objectives, because if you're obvious, like there was one where I was obviously trying to make it happen. So, of course, they stopped me, you know. <laughs> so, so so you want to kind of be clever about what you do. There's also like this oust action. So let's say, so you have a card on the board that you have influence on, and I want to kind of get you out of there. I take this oust action, and we basically, it's almost like a combat where we check all of the cards that are adjacent and count up your influence versus my influence. And then we have like kind of a starting initial strength. Then we're each going to like blind bid a card from our hand. And there are, of course, like little cards and things that might that uh, can like special effects that you can kind of do here. But ultimately, it's going to be the person who has the highest strength is going to get to either keep their territory or lose it and get kicked off. And they give you some like little compensation if you do get kicked off. So that's that's cool. Um, But also the other thing that's exciting about the combat or the ousting action is that there's a way to auto win. So, for example, I don't remember which is which, but like basically, let's say you go in with a lower initial strength than me. If you play an ace card for the blind bid and I don't play a king card, you will automatically win. Or something. There's some way you can auto win, but there's also a way where it could get canceled if depending on what we play. So that's always like kind of an exciting thing too. Uh, Another thing, like there are two other things I'd like to highlight about the game that I thought were cool. One is like on your turn, besides like um, you could do like two main actions. You also have like a couple free actions. And one of the free actions is called scheme. And when you scheme, you're you're built playing cards into a tableau, but it's like a temporary tableau because it's only going to be for this round. But you chain them based on the faction on the card. So I could play one card, do something cool, or maybe it lets me do another action better. And then I could play another card that has one of the same factions as that card to keep doing stuff. And you can kind of keep chaining these cards. And at that point, you're looking at like the scheme effect on the card. So... Multi-use cards, love it, love, love it. Love it, love it. Love a good combo as well, multi-use yeah. and combo. Yeah, so you can definitely Salt. like set up, So yeah, you can set up some cool combos. And then there are also event cards. So there are standard events where you might end up drawing one at the end of your turn. You keep it in your hand until you want to play it at the start of a future turn. 
And then it'll apply to everyone until your following turn, then it goes away. So you can kind of be strategic with how you play those. Something I thought was a little spicy and uh, adds a little bit of chaos to the game is there are also these edict events. And when you draw an edict event, that gets played immediately. And basically, if there's one, there'll be one type of resource on it. And if any players have that resource, it goes back to the bank. And then you take six resources from the bank, put it on that edict card. And it's basically, it's a fixed economy in terms of the amount of resources. Like there, you're basically depleting almost completely that resource for everybody. And it ticks down over time where you'll be able to like take one off and keep it for yourself. One goes back to the bank until that card goes away. So that's kind of neat because it's like, yeah. oh, shoot, all of a sudden now we we don't have much purple resource, you know, purple favor. I forget what, you know, exactly it's yeah. called. I thought that was kind of neat and also annoying sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> when and you're planning, when you're planning. Yeah, exactly. When and your you're like, about to do it. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it's like, you don't, nobody has control over it because it's like you flip that event and if it's one of those edicts, it has to get played. So it could screw you too. Uh, In that case. But the last thing I wanted to mention that I thought was kind of um, innovative, I guess, is a lot of PAX games are centered around having a card market. So this game is like everything. The map is cards, multi-use cards, you're playing cards. So usually there's a card market and like you pay for cards the further to the right in the market they are, the more expensive they are. And you usually like put a coin on the ones as you're paying so that other players, when they take it, Okay, this is this, this is different. There's this Chamberlain token that sits above one of the cards in the market. And let's say the card market has five cards. At the end of my turn, I have to draw back to refill my hand. I can just draw, like, let's say I need to refill three cards. I could just draw three from the top of the deck, and that's that. But if I want to take some of the face-up ones, so I have control over what I'm adding to my hand, if I'm only taking one from the, the court or the face-up market... I can take any card I want, but if I'm taking two, one of them has to be the one that's under this Chamberlain token. And then, oh. yeah, and then regardless of that, after I do my draw, my redraw step, if there is a card under the Chamberlain token still, that is the card that gets discarded. So it's not just like discard the card that's furthest to the right. And then the Chamberlain token shifts. So there's like a like a, a neat little thing with the way the market works that at first, like people I was playing with were like, why are what? That doesn't make sense. Why not just do this? But then it like, as you, as it kind of clicks, it's like, Oh, that is, that's pretty neat. So, um, so I thought that was kind of cool overall. Like I, we, we really liked it and I really appreciate how it's like, doesn't take that long to play. Like, I feel like it was maybe an hour and a half hour and 45 for three players. First game of it, you know, so I like that it's kind of relatively snappy for kind of a meaty experience. Again, the teach was minimal for experienced PAX gamers. Another thing that I like in games is that the game can end in two ways. So the main way is if somebody completes two plots, they win the game. But before that happens, if those edict events, you know, there are a number of them, if a number of them are discarded like gone they came out they we resolved them then that's another way and the scoring works differently if it ends that way so it kind of like keeps you on your toes a bit i did find it like kind of challenging sometimes to read the board because the cards are the cards have a lot on them since they are multi-use and when you're putting influence discs and you're trying to like achieve these plots but you're like wait do i have a connection of same fact you know that yeah. was a little a little bit challenging. It might get easier the more you play it. But overall, I really liked it. It it definitely feels different than other PAX games, but also still feels PAXy and in that it's historical, card-driven. Um, there's interesting interaction with the card market row. And uh, yeah, I just, I like yeah. card-based games like that. I like, I like, like PAX Premier is one of my favorite games. I love PAX Renaissance the couple times I played it, even though it's, that one's, <laughs> super opaque and compl- com- <laughs> complex, like super complex. But, but mechanics, uh, mechanics yeah. is very different. Yeah. This, this one sounds very efficient as well. I mean, that's probably the downside. What you say is a bit confusing on the cards because they 
multi-use card. It's very efficient. They're trying to do a yeah. lot of things in the card. And, you know, for the first time, it might get a little confusing. But once you know what's what and for, and hopefully it'll get easier. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, other people will like really appreciate those multi-use cards. And, and that whole thing, like I said, when you're moving around on the board and revealing cards and getting to take it in your hand, and now all of a sudden you can set up something for scheming or something for later powerful to use when you do the oust action. That was really cool. But yeah, this is uh, Pax Illuminatin. And it's, uh, I guess it was crowdfunded on Kickstarter. It was successfully funded, I think, in November last year. And they have the late pledge open through mid-February, if that sounds exciting to anyone. But also, it's just going to be out. <laughs> 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 it's, it's also targeted to be out by the end of the year. So, um, yeah, I really liked Pax Illuminati. This what is a great been- game. Yeah, have you have you played uh, many any of the PAX games or? No, I only played once, and that's PAX Premier. So I'm not okay. really like the person who like, okay, what's the difference? Uh, <laughs> so I don't, I don't think I have played enough PAXers like you do. Sounds like you've played lots, and you can tell exactly the difference. But I like to. PAX Premier was quite long and quite heavy and we play with one of our friends who think like to think a lot and that yeah. was a really long game <laughs> oh gotcha gotcha <laughs> and, and I'm ass- oh, i love our friends yeah but he likes to think a lot <laughs> i'm assuming you played the second edition like, yes with the pretty the purple pieces yeah yeah, yeah. yeah the pretty pieces and then the yeah. cross cloth yeah, mat, cloth I mat. Yeah. yeah oh my gosh so yeah. chunky that's so beautiful oh yeah it's really oh, yeah. smart it's been love, it's been a while yeah been a while cool. since i played it all right, Stella, so what else have you been playing? Well, we have been playing this game. So this particular game has not left my life since I was younger. Uh, this I used to play this particular board game as the video game, like oh. a lot. And there is like one, two, three, four, five, six. And this game is Heroes of Might and Magic. I've been a big, big fan. It's been a time, I wouldn't say time waster. It's my solo experience, my most activities before I get into board games was video games. And Heroes of Might and Magic was one. And now they have Heroes of Might and Magic Tree, the board game. Oh, okay. I've never heard of it. Yes. So this is completely different. This is not a Euro, it's not your Euro game, but it has got some euro mechanics and this is a turn based game where you build your army so you build your castles you upgrade your buildings to recruit more and better armies and you have heroes that goes around the board and fight neutral armies or opponents. Obviously, back then, I just played the u- neutral a- army and uh, AI players who does that thing that I need to okay, defeat. gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you're collecting resources, you up your level, you up your heroes, and just very satisfying playing that in between other games. It's not real time. It's just building up your engine slowly. That's my favorite part of the game, I guess. And then you go around Ooh. fighting things and getting better, getting reward. And there are missions as well. You need to find certain things maybe. Uh, the difference is that in the video games, I use cheat. <laughs> it's like, you know how <laughs> in video games you can put co- code and you uh-huh. you know you, you gain more money or whatever sometimes <laughs> if, if, if I can't be bothered. And obviously the video games you cannot. But in the, sorry, in the board games, you cannot. But in the board games, they just released, oh, it's fulfilling from Kickstarter right now. So these heroes of Mind and Magic, the three, so they have one, two, three, four, six. They choose number three, the board games. I think the best version of Heroes of Mind and Magic, the video game, is number three. Okay. The release year is this year, so 2024. It was designed by Kamil Bielkowski. I'm sorry if I butcher the name, and Jacob as... Oleg Zik, and it's published by Icon Studio. So it plays one to four players, but the base game is one to three, one to three players. Four, the fourth player is expansion, so different heroes that you can gotcha. use to play. It's very similar, but much more 
simple down, obviously, like, you know, lots of video games adaptation to board games, like I know 1800, for example, I play that as well. And the board game is much simpler. Otherwise it won't work. Same with heroes. So a battle is much simplified, although they have an expansion that makes it feel like it's called Battlefield expansion that makes feels like the video games battle. But okay. the base game is simple, you know, battle of certain units can move certain spaces and then each unit has got certain powers and health and certain power uh, and they only put like two different types or only a few or a lot. While in the video games, it's like this, like the numbers, but this is the, they're very sim- simplified, which is really great. Gotcha, gotcha. But it feels a lot of that. And I think the mechanics work. There's the deck building mechanics that helps you with the battle. That really Ooh. works. I love deck building. Like I'm still yeah. playing Dominion app on um, my <laughs> iPad <laughs> right now. This is obviously reminiscing from the video games era that I used to do. And this still feels like that you still get around the board collecting things like revealing this folk of war so you reveal the main board slowly oh cool they have action point allowance as the main mechanic to move around and they are different options different expansion and missions as well so say you you have to have the most mining you control the most mining or something like that in one game so you need to find those and then have it yours and then defend them and recruit more things. It's it's very um yeah, it's this combination of Merit Trash and Euro Euro okay. games, I feel. Very different than other games and very different than Alexander Fister game, I would say I would say <laughs> that we are actually eventually going to talk about. Yeah. But I, I really, really enjoy it. It's probably my type of game than Terrence type of game. He's gotcha. this, yeah, he's more Euro Euro and this is like oh adventure it's, kind it's, of fantasy. Yeah, adventure. It's kind of like RPG almost like you're going around. Well, there's no RPG on it, but there's still story. It has there's more of that still... feeling, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, I really love love this and the fact that you can engine build, you can choose you have resources, you're collecting resources around the board as well. Your heroes collecting collecting resources, and you can choose to recruit, you can choose to upgrade your building, which one's first. I think it's go about hand by hand. And then you can upgrade, um, definitely. Like upgrade is the fun part of the, the video game as well. You just upgrade the building, recruit more oh, people, cool. um, rinse and repeat. But it's just very satisfying things to to do. It's one of those that, you know, it's it's very satisfying when you gain lots of armies and you, you attack different, you know, neutral players and you get win, you want the... You won the battle, and then if you go around and then attack army that is lower level than you, they just like automatically scare it away. That was in video games, and in the board oh. games, they just like go away, and then you get you get half of the experience rather than the full experience, and you upgrade your experience as well. So um Ooh. yeah, I'm super excited. I'm just going through the expansions right now. So I play the base game. I want to get together with some other friends and play more of those. Uh, by the way, we have been commissioned on the how, for how to play for heroes, we have that on oh, our channel. Cool. But again, this is something so you're that working I'm really on, excited. working up to making the video. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the video is out there, but I'm just, oh, okay, just really, okay. really excited. Yeah, I'm like, oh my gosh, Heroes of Might and Magic 3, the board game. That's like, I saw when it was out on Kickstarter. I'm like, well, I want to get it. <laughs> okay, wait. So I, I have a couple questions because like I'm – I feel like I've heard this before, heard of this before, like Heroes of Might and Magic. That sounds familiar, yeah. but I'm not a big video gamer, so I don't know too much about it. So is the game, I guess two questions. One is, yes. um, you mentioned you've been playing it solo. Is it cooperative when you play with multiplayer, with more players? And do you enjoy it, playing it that way? Yes. So it can be both. It can be just solo against computer. It could be played with other people which is online, obviously, or hot seat if you want to, or you can do cooperatively. You achieve the same goal or team versus team. Oh, but with the with the board game. Um, oh, sorry, with the board I, game. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. The I main, with the board game. Sorry. <laughs> sorry I was so this is this is competitive. Competitive is the base game. So you ah, just okay. you know you own you each. It's like um, I don't know if you heard of Warcraft. 
Warcraft and Starcraft. That's Heard of kind them, of like yes. yeah, yeah. So it's also video games that uh, same with the board game. So the board game it is competitive mainly. That's the base game, and you can play solo campaign. So there's a, a solo variant which we I actually personally haven't played the solo campaign, and I'm just excited to explore different scenarios. And it has different victory conditions. So yeah, so those those game modes yeah. you can do. Okay, so my other question is going to be around that. Like the like, is it typically or is it always played as a campaign, or do you play like one off scenarios and missions? It would game. be played. <laughs> yes, uh, the board game. Yeah, thank you. It <laughs> would play as multiplayer. Who wins what? So it could be the most victory point or the most. Sorry, the most whoever controlled the most minds, for example. Gotcha. And yeah, rather than solo. So I'm yet into solo yet. Um, I'm Eventually I'll get to that, but I'll, I'll get the multiplayer going going on first. And we're going to just, you know, build that and then attack each other. There's a lot of neutral enemies and a great mechanic for neutral enemies. So I think cool. solo would be quite easy. It's like easy to ease into that. Okay, okay. And then when you play it, or is are you playing it as like a campaign? Um, oh, like no, if you play no, not a campaign. Or is it, or is yeah. it just like you just, just play one-off one games? Okay, sorry, cool. yes, yes, just one-off games. It's not like I don't know, Sleeping Gods. That's just or gotcha. Ticket to Ride Legacy. Yeah, it's not like that. It's just like one-off that I play. And since this one's Heroes of Might and Magic Three, and it's corresponding to number three, the video game. I guess is this the first time it's been a board game for this? Correct. Okay, and they choose- cool. That, yeah, they choose number three as the board game because it's, it's just the most popular. Yeah, the most popular one. And I think most people like that one. And I think that's why they make this. I mean, number one to number six, they're all quite similar. They have slightly different different things. But, you know, the heroes, the, the things, everything is the characters. They're from number three, the, the video games number cool. three. It makes me want to play the video games again, but then I've got the board games, so I might just like play the board games. <laughs> <laughs> Staff decision. <laughs> awesome. So that is Heroes of Might and Magic 3, the board game. So okay. I, I figured I'd do a little bit of a uh, bookend here, uh, unintentional bookend, but you were talking <gasps> about dragons with Wormspan. So the, yeah. the next game I'm going to bring up is Dragon Keepers, which is a, uh, it just came out in late, I don't know if you played it, have you played it yet? No, no, I want okay. to, it's got dragon. Well, Heroes has yeah, got dragon was, as well. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, so so I was going to say, uh, this came out from Cosmos, just, I think it might have dropped at PAX Unplugged at 2023, so I think it was just like a late 2023 release, and it's designed by Michael Menzel, and also who, Michael Menzel also does the art, which I think for most of his wow. games, that is the case, which is like always wild to me, like the designers that are also artists. So, so impressive. That's, that's impressive. It's, yeah. Like Ryan Lockhart is also another one that does yeah. that. Yeah, It's yeah. designer. Like, how do you like your brain is like <laughs> art mechanic. Yeah. It's impressive. It's impressive. I just have no art skills uh, in terms of like illustrating things. So I, it's, Yeah. Very impressive, <laughs> but this is uh, published by Cosmos, and it's for two to four players. And I did get a review copy of this at PAX Unplugged. Otherwise, honestly, like I don't know if this was the kind of game that I would just go and grab and gravitate towards. But I'm glad, <laughs> you know, when I saw it though, when I saw it, I had a meeting uh, with uh, Cosmos, and when I saw these dra- these dragon cards, are freaking adorable. Uh, oh. And I was like, okay, I want to try it. I, I like, you know, I like light games because I have a lot of people that I play with that don't like heavy games. So yes. it's nice to like have a variety of options. So I was yep, yep. happy to uh, try it. And this one, I don't have the box handy, but the the shape of the box, it it's like very, <laughs> it's very thin and, yeah. um, and like, long, it's kind of a different shape, but I like how thin it is. <laughs> Because this is another one that's <laughs> the tape measure is out again. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's out a, again. <laughs> <laughs> this is another one that's uh, primarily card card based. Um, but in this game, we are magical dragon keepers, and we're basically mm-hmm. trying to look after the young dragons. And so, in the center of the table, you'll have these two stacks of cards that you'll set up, 
next to each other. And they're next to each other touching such that it looks like it's a book that's open with, you know, two pages showing. And that's the magic book for the game. So on the left page of the magic book, you'll see a number with some rewards underneath. And on the right page, you see one of the dragon types. So there are four different colors of dragons and uh, they're just different types of dragons. And then underneath the book, the magic book, um, there's a display of two cards, one under each page. And those are just dragons that you're going to be drafting into your hand. So on your turn, this is this game is very straightforward. Like the rule book is four pages. It's very like this really thin booklet with illustrations and examples. And it's only like four pages. But on your turn, you can take one to three dragons and you're going to do it one at a time from the display And after you take one, you're going to refill the display from the corresponding page of the book. There is a little bit of a push your luck element because, like, let's say I take the dragon. There's a green dragon card on the left side of the display. I'm going to refill with the left page of the book. So now there's going to be a different number, possibly, and a different reward that's showing. And why does that matter? Because... After you're done your draw cards step of your turn, you're going to get to play dragons. But when you play dragons, you can only play if you have a set that matches the value and type of dragon shown in the magic book. So, for example, if there's a two on the left page of the magic book and a green dragon on the right page, uh, when it's time for me to play cards, I can play exactly two dragons or I don't. Like, I don't, I can't play one dragon, can't play three dragons, you know, so the magic book is telling you what you can play. And if you do play that, you're going to get whatever reward is under the number. So, wow. Yeah. So there's a push. Yeah. There's, yeah, yeah, there's a push your luck element to like, you know, maybe the, the number is showing a five or something and the color is an orange dragon. And I only have, I have three orange dragons in my hand. So maybe I draw one of the dragons from the left side to see if I could get a different number that I can actually play on. Uh, So that's neat. And before you play the dragons, you can also manipulate the magic book with cards from your hand by putting them face down on top of the book. So that's another way you can kind of manipulate what's on the book and you have a little bit more control in that way. But you're also losing a card from your hand that you won't be able to like kind of score. And then, so let's say you are able to, let's say there's a two and then green dragons and you play two green dragons. Every other player gets the opportunity to follow and they will, if they have two green dragons in their hand and want to play them, they can play them and they'll get the same reward that you got. So there's a whole thing with you also, as the game progresses, wanting to do something where you can play dragons and get some reward, but hopefully not your opponents or not that many of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so that's kind of a, a, a little fun element, but the rewards on them, the higher the amount of dragons, usually the better the reward. And the rewards could be, are usually these amulet pieces. Each piece of the amulet, once you have three pieces of an amulet, it forms an amulet. And then you get to put a little bonus pearl token in the middle. And usually when you're you're getting these, you're going to either take the highest value amulet piece or the lowest value. So people will see what you're getting. So if I'm taking one that's the lowest and the lowest is one, everyone's going to see, okay, that's one point. But then I put it face down. If I take the highest, maybe the highest value one is 15 or something. I take that, I put it face down. Everybody remembers, oh, Candace has that high value amulet piece, but you're not like really keeping track of exact, you can't really keep track right. of where everybody is point wise. Yeah, except Taryn. His, Taryn would have the memory <laughs> for it. That. Except Taryn. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> uh, so then uh, another reward you might see is like you can get a shadow dragon, which is a wild dragon. So you'll be able to get a shadow dragon. Those are cool. Um, you can also get crystals. And in like the core game, these crystals, they can be spent to allow you to draw a fourth card because usually you draw one, two, or three cards on your turn. So if you have a crystal, you can spend it to draw a fourth card. And then some of the cards will give you golden eggs as rewards. And they're just flat 
worth four points each, but whoever has the most golden eggs at the end of the game, one of them flips over and has 16 points, which is awesome. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so it's like, like it's, it's a bit of a luck as well. Well, with with the golden eggs, though, you can see who has the most. So, you know, when you when you win them, you see that golden egg, but whoever ends up and ties are friendly. So if you and I mm-hmm. both have the most golden eggs, we're both going to flip one over and the golden eggs are always 16 points on the other side. So right. um, you do you do know what's going on there. But um, another bit of spice with this game is, so I said you you play sets of dragons, right? When you play the same color, you're all, always ever playing the same color on one given turn, but you're going to put them in a stack. So now I have a green stack in front of me. Let's say on my next turn, I play orange dragons. Now I have an orange stack and a green stack. So everything's fine. Everything's fine. But now let's say I play a blue stack. I have to decide which side I want to put that blue stack on because whichever stack is now in the middle, I can no longer play those kind of dragons. That stack is locked down. So that's kind of that's kind of wild because they also incentivize you to play all four colors because if you're first to play all four colors, so if I have a white stack, a blue stack, an orange stack, and a green stack, I get a, a crest token. And if I'm first to get a crest, it's more valuable. These are like high point tokens. So it's like they're saying, hey, be the first to do this. But you're also in a tough spot because now there are two colors of dragons you can no longer play for the rest of the game. But yeah, this game, like the art is just fantastic. These dragons, you just want to take them home and have them for pets. They're they're freaking adorable. <laughs> um <laughs> It's it's a I I really like this game at three. I never got a chance to play it at four players, but um, two is okay. But like I think three is like really really nice because like the following gets a little more uh, interesting. But I found this game like has a lot of like player engagement and interaction because you know you have the push your luck elements with how many dragons do I want to pick up versus I do want to be able to like get some amulets and everything. And I should also mention the game will end once a certain amount of completed amulets are on the board among all players. So um, you're kind of like watching for that timer too. And there's like some variability of like, uh oh, when's the game going to end? Uh oh, if that person gets one more, that's going to trigger the end. And yeah. um, I like that the the most of your points are face down because it makes scoring exciting at the end. Of course, you could see. Like, if I see, Stella, you have way more amulet pieces than me, I could be like, ah, you probably have more points than me, but you might have all low-point amulet pieces, and I might have more high-point ones. Who knows? Who knows? A lot of of victory points um, options as well. Sorry, I got that wrong about the X, so whoever's got the most end flip, it's not like a random flip. Okay, it's not luck. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. the, The random thing, though, is the pearls. So when you complete one of your amulets, you're going to take one of these pearl tokens and that is random. Like they, those points vary and your opponents don't know how much, I mean, there's a range. It's not anything wild and crazy, but um, the other cool thing about this game is it comes with these six magic chest tokens. So when you're like, when you have the experience with the game and you want to like spice it up a little bit, you randomly pick one of those to play with. And now instead of those blue crystals, being like you hey you can play a fourth card this turn they have some other cool ability so it just gives you a different way to use the crystals which i thought was pretty neat because it's like you're using the same the same resource but you're doing different things with that same resource and it kind of varies Mm -hmm. up the game so um i didn't even realize before talking today that you were a dragon lover but you should definitely (laughs) check oh yes check this game out yeah. Well, definitely. I actually had a quick peek on BGG. <laughs> <laughs> they are beautiful. <laughs> yeah, aren't they? Because I had to. Yeah, yeah. I know. It was like so cool. They, I, I love that art style as well. And I got to have it in Cosmos. I'll get it in Australia, hopefully. Yeah, so, I hope you. I hope two you two games. Yeah, 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 I feel like I hope two games I was sold today. It. <laughs> yeah, I have like two. It's like it sounds like it's not a it's not a heavy game, but the decision space is great. I mean, you can just focus on that. You can focus on yeah, interaction yeah. and 
And hey, you like card games. Both of your games exactly, that you mentioned are Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's this just so is clever. just something. Right. And I think this takes like 30 minutes to play. And like you can play it with just about anyone. Like it's not overly complex. Uh, but it does have some fun decisions. And even like with the follow um, yeah. mechanic, it's like maybe you don't always want to, even if you can. And, you know, you can decide how you play your cards. So, yeah, yeah. So that is Dragon Keepers. And before we start getting into Alexander Fister, I just had to give a quick Keyforge update because uh, any regular listeners of this podcast know that I am... I've been like so in love with Keyforge lately, but I <laughs> ended up just last week getting my Grim Reminders Game Found pledge delivered. And that was really <laughs> exciting. I have a I have my own named deck right now. It's called uh, Rakishly Deadly Candy Drum. I'm oh stoked my about gosh! That. Yeah, I know, I know. And then <laughs> I so also. Yeah, and then I also like recently, I guess after the last podcast either dropped or was recorded, I ended up guesting on two really cool Keyforge podcasts when they heard about through I think the BGG podcast that I was like super into Keyforge, I got invited <laughs> to uh be on two Keyforge podcasts. One was Keyforge Public Radio with Zach Armstrong and it is that was actually his last episode so I was like I felt oh really God. honored to kind of uh yeah. it was funny like my friend Brandon's like you killed a Keyforge Public Radio Candace well done no. <laughs> uh, but it was it was a great it was a great podcast and like one you know now I'll still listen to to like just soak up info since I'm still new to this game but and then I was also on an episode of Help from Future Self with Sydney and Blake. Uh, that was amazing, and they're all friends too. So they kind of took what I said on Zach's podcast and like went a little deeper with me. Uh, but yeah, if anybody is like into Keyforge, they are like awesome Keyforge podcasts. And now I have new Keyforge. Go friends, listen to it, which is and, cool. And go yeah, listen to it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> And now a word from our sponsor. The world's best race car drivers are lined up for the Japanese Grand Prix. The weather conditions are poor. The rain is relentless as the engines rev. Managing the turns will be crucial. Only the best will make it to the end. Heat Pedal to the Metal, the multi-award winning racing game, is back with a new expansion and new challenges for drivers. Heat Heavy Rain brings you two new tracks, the Japanese Grand Prix just after a torrential rain with puddles and treacherous turns, and the infamous Mexico track that challenges even veteran drivers with its formidable chicanes. This isn't just another race, it's the ultimate test of skill. Heavy Rain dares you to adapt, overcome, and conquer with every decision meaning the difference between victory and spinning out. Also, a seventh racer joins the fray, intensifying the competition. Will you rise as a champion, or will the heavy rain wash your hopes away? Fasten your seatbelts and gear up for an exhilarating adventure with the Heat Heavy Rain expansion, available everywhere in April. All right, let's do it. This is this is what we let's came for. Do it. We're going to talk yep. about Alexander Fister. Oh, the moment. The moment is here. Yeah, Alex. <laughs> nice, friendly <Yeah>. Alex. <laughs> friendly Alex. Uh, Alexander Fister is a game designer from Austria. First, like, let's just talk about just some of the things that make love. his style unique. Yeah, and it's like what yeah. we love about him. Yeah, the design and the personality. So yeah. we're talking about the the elements of the game first, right? Yeah, so let's talk I, about the I'm, elements, some of the common elements we see in some Alexander Fister games. I'm going to start with the engine building because I love great, satisfying, not necessarily not necessarily winning <laughs> for myself engine build. Like you in the game, you feel so satisfied. You feel yeah. building up, gaining something, and then until you look around and see other people's engine building and engines better than <laughs> me. <laughs> enjoying it it's like yeah. oh yeah i feel good like this is great like oh no no it's not <laughs> but that's that's one of the things yeah that's one of the things that i, I really love right 
So do you, Aisha? Yeah, and it's it's like you're you're so right because it's like it's so satisfying. Like I feel like every Alexander Pfister game, like he's such a versatile designer where he has you know we'll kind of mention some of his his spectrum of like light to heavy games. Yeah, um, but like his games still, regardless if they're like some of his heavier games or the lightest games, I feel like they all have this like satisfying feel to them like you feel good playing them yeah. or at least i've had that but like to piggyback oh, off yeah. your engine building another thing that i find very common in a lot of his games especially the, like the the medium heavier euros is the the fact that there's always this way to like where you can not always but like a lot of the games have a way where you unlock mm -hmm. cool bonuses. Like you're, if we think about Great Western Trail, you're taking discs off of your player board. I think Boom oh my Lake gosh, has yes. that. I think, you know, like yeah. almost a black, Blackout Hong Kong, a lot of these yeah. games have something where you're like, and you're getting to strategize mm -hmm. around what you unlock and the order that you do it. And it's so satisfying because you're like building an engine Very. by unlocking. And usually when you're unlocking, you're doing yeah. something cool on the board with you're placing the thing oh, gosh, that you're yeah. unlocking, you know? Achievement achievement unlocks is like in the video games term. <laughs> achievement yeah, unlock yeah. for sure. Yeah, it's just like what which one you want to do. That's actually drive your engine as well. It's not just bonus, but you know, like the one I don't know, the the quick example in Great Western Trail, you're unlocking a disc from your playboard you're putting mm -hmm. it on the station and that's totally engine built as well at the same time so it's yeah. yeah you're right it's it's like side by side engine built and then it's unlocking for the engine built yeah um the, the other one that we that we think is you know we actually mentioned it and that is the multi-use cards i love multi-use yeah. cards the card that, okay, you can discard something for money or you can collect it to exchange for something else or you can use this particular card, you know, even like yeah, face, face down in all my goods as resources. Yeah, uh, yeah. You can build it or you can discard it for resources or you can face down as the resource that you produce. Like, you know, that's just like great. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, we're we're both fans of multi-use cards, and I think uh, yeah. another thing I'm gonna I'm gonna piggyback off what you said once again. Yeah, and yeah. I feel like a lot of Alexander Fister games have a lot of icons, but yeah. like once you kind of, but it's always like really good, like because once yes. you like understand the rules, it's like okay, this is so clean and and well done, and also a lot of them like I don't I don't know that the same person is doing it for all of these games but they mm -hmm. still all have this like feel where you're almost like yep this is an alexander fister game you know yes like see, yes. seeing these icons understanding how they work so i think that's another thing that i think about when i think about his games i yeah i totally agree it feels like if you learn of you know the rules of this game and then his other games oh yeah that means that same with the other game it's like it's the same thing yeah. so it's familiar yeah. <laughs> familiarity of the iconography from one to another i think it's the same yeah. with Gar garfield games as well shem phillips if you play oh, Raiders yeah. of North Sea and things like the next one oh yeah this is to recruit townsfolk for example <laughs> right so, right it's, yeah, great. It means that, you know, there's not a lot of facts usually, which is great. I mean, if translation purposes for, for the publisher right. is also great. So another thing that I love is the slow or and fast move balance. Mm. Like you can see that in Maracaibo, parts of Maracaibo, well, Great Western Boon Trail, Lake all of has them. This too. Boon Lake, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. you have played Boon Lake. I haven't. Like very sad. Yeah. But sounds like <laughs> I'm gonna laugh. Boon Lake. It's like that. Almost fee missing out if you moving too fast because you can't go back to the previous action, or yeah. also fee of losing something good uh, further further ahead, further along. I'm like, sure, sure. what do you want to do? Do you want to? Yeah, what do you want to do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my God. So like, I guess you have to look around as well. Somebody's triggered the end, for example, and then you might have to move faster or like you just like leisurely go to one every 
every single action and then move slower and right. then trying to gain a lot of possible. But then like in Great Western Trail, you don't want to miss out on delivering the cattle a lot. What right, do you do? It's right. always, Do you, you want to push the game? Do you want to pull? Yeah. 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 It, yeah. Right? It, it, you're, so, you're so right that there are so many of his games that have – that element to it like yeah do i want because it's usually like your movement options and a lot of these the the heavier euro ones are like you could move x amount of steps but you you know so do you yeah. only want to move one and be like yeah. a little bit behind are you the one mm-hmm. that like like players are kind of driving the pace of the game and that kind of yeah. like lends itself to like really cool player interaction and mm-hmm. like just different gaming experiences which I was curious, what do you like? Do you like slow or fast, Candice, usually? Uh, Always, it depends I, on the game. Well. It, 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 it's going to depend on the game. But right. I think I'm, you know, I have like this like scarcity bias where you would think that would mean go slowly so that I get a little of everything. But I also don't want to be the one left yes. behind. So yes. I think, I, think I'm, I would probably lean more to be the one that's pushing things and go a little bit faster and also just to like put the pressure on everybody else. <laughs> so I think, but, but I would say, <laughs> but I would, I would say it, it, it varies. Yeah. Yeah. It varies. I'm, I'm usually the one that like behind. So you're the one that's like, stress me out. No, can you slow down? I'm still going to do a lot. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But I love it. Like this gives me like, yeah. it just gives me, urgency to do things quicker it's great yeah yeah (laughs) yeah the the other thing i would say you know as we talk about all these things about alexander fister's games the i guess the overall thing that i feel with a lot of his games is that they're innovative in how they feel because it's like a unique blend of mechanisms like I yeah. love how deck building is used in Great Western oh. Trail where oh, yes. it's like, you know, you can choose to go heavy deck building or and that's like one strategy or you don't need to do that much and you can still win the game and do something else. And like if we think about like the card programming in uh, Mombasa slash Sky, Sky Mines. Mines. Yes is yes. so cool and so fresh. Oh, my but God. then also, yes. like, he kind of reused a little bit of that in Blackout Hong Kong as well, which I haven't played in forever. But I just yes. always, like, with his designs, like, I'm always, like, I just can't see another game that's exactly like this. Like, there's just something fascinating about how his mind <laughs> works to make these games. I know. You know? I know. I was just always wonder, always admire, always no doubt. One day I get to meet Alexander Fister in person. I'll be so oh. no doubt. I'm like, oh my god. Me too. Me too. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, One day. So wow. like, yeah. So like, we we kind of like noted that how versatile uh, Alexander Fister is as a designer. So I just want to like just shout out through like I put together a little list of. Uh, I think mostly games that I've definitely played. Let's start since I think that's where our love is mostly with the heavier yes. games. Yeah, so, let's um, do that. so Mombasa slash Sky Mines. Mombasa, I think, was his first like heavy release, and I just, I remember when that game came out. Like Great Western Trail was the first game that I played by Alexander Fister. And I had I was super clueless about it, but I still fell in love with it and found it like extremely fascinating. And yeah, I remember yeah. like hearing about Mombasa and being like, oh, I don't think I'm going to like it. And then I played it. and I was like, mm-hmm. whoa, this is so cool. And I'm so glad now that Sky Mines exists with a better theme and it's got like more yeah. modules and every everything. Yep. And then and it's like, brain burner. It's brain burner. Like it'd be like I remember like you it was like it's probably one of the heavy game that I've. I play it maybe, and they'll like, yeah. What is going on? And then my brain hurts, and then yeah. well, I want that again. <laughs> yeah, give me, give me some more of that. Give me yes. some more of that. And yeah. then it's like that's- Great Western Trail, which is you know that's probably one of his most popular designs. Yeah. Yep. Still playing that every day on on Board Game Arena. <laughs> Thank goodness for Board Game Arena. Yo, oh my gosh! Yeah, <laughs> so good. It's like I played like. I don't know. It's so many games, like maybe 10 games at once. And just, yeah, I'm so glad that Great Western Trail is there. 
Yes. Yeah. Hopefully more, yeah. more to come. <laughs> well, and, and then, yeah. like, did you ever get a chance to play Blackout Hong Kong? I did, I did. That was when the uh, kind of, like, first out, and I was also, oh, wow. But, you know, automatically you will probably compare with the other one. I was like, oh, yeah, this is like Alex Penn Theater. Let's, let's play this. So we played that. Yeah. And I think that I might be quite memorized by the Rondel action in Blackout Hong Kong. Because yeah. I, I feel like that might be one of the first time I play with that mechanic. Is it? It's been so, so long like the since I played. The resources right? around the wheel. Yeah, the way the resources yes, yes. work. Sorry, around yes, the... yes, the resources. Yeah, not the rondel action. Yeah, that rondel resources thing. You're like, oh, that's this... so smart. <laughs> yeah, this game. I remember when it came out, and I was like so hyped for it because at that point, like Great Western Trail, my boss, were just like, like my jam, and yeah, um. And then when I played it, uh, so for people who don't know what Blackout Hong Kong is, um, basically Hong Kong gets in the game struck by this like unexpected like massive blackout. And yeah. the government is trying to, you're trying to help the government get get society back in order. So you have volunteers and all, all sorts of things. And honestly, yeah. like one of the things that I... Like, I remember, like, again, I haven't played this in forever since I played it a couple times when it came out. And then, um, and I liked it. I didn't, like, love it. And I, th- I always yeah. felt like the there was a missed opportunity to make it feel more thematic for what yeah, the yeah. theme Yeah, it must be a deal. Yeah. Mm. It was just kind of like, you know, a dry Euro game. But it had some, like, card programming, similar... To Sky Mines, Sky Mines. And yeah, a little bit. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I think I want to revisit it at some point. And and there's yeah, a board yeah, element too. to it where you're trying like to like map. get these houses out. Yeah, and you're like trying to like surround pandemic the areas. <laughs> <laughs> it did look kind of like pandemic. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's definitely but that not was, pandemic though. But. Yeah, that was when I was like thinking about that. Huh? I I would like to revisit it at some point. Um, yeah, now all yeah. these years later. And then there's Maracaibo uh, came out, I think, after that. And I then know. the Heavy Game Front. Yeah. And that was I mean, if, like... If like, like at Hong Kong and Maracaibo on Board Game Arena, I'll jump on it. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Get 10 games wink, going. Wink, wink, wink here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously. Yeah. Yes. But like it, Maracaibo. Maracaibo was like, it was like, you know, you're sailing around the Caribbean. So you're moving your boat again. You have this fast and slow movement thing. But yeah. instead oh, of yes. instead of like the rondelle in Great Western Trail where players are like delivering whenever and they're kind of pushing the game along by the pace yeah. of the workers coming out. This one had it where you if one player gets to the end of the track, that triggers the end of the round and then you kind of like yeah. reset. But it still like has, you know, you have these different city tiles out that get put out randomly mm-hmm. there's like lots of variability you're unlocking things you're very cool i haven't different. actually yeah. played it that much but i like it a lot yeah that's just um i haven't actually played as much as i would like in so many great games right like even right, like right the between alexander fish's own games is competing to each other which one are gonna get played next <laughs> <laughs> you're like yeah. so many great they're all great but which one's your favorite yeah. we're gonna reveal that later Yes, we will. <laughs> uh, and then, and then, like the other, the other heavy one that I think's um, worth mentioning, or maybe the only other heavy one we haven't mentioned is Boone Lake. And mm-hmm. you haven't played this yet, right? No, no. Unfortunately, uh, I think I, I. Yes, I have it. I have the expansion. I haven't had a chance to play it. Silly me. I I only played it once, and I liked it, but I didn't love it. So I just right. haven't revisited it. But also, like, you know, just looking it up in preparation for this episode, I was like, ooh, I really want to play this again. <laughs> so yeah. I, I, I I, definitely, you jury's still out on this one for me, but I, mm-hmm. I definitely liked it. I, I just didn't get that bug of like, ooh, I need to play this again tomorrow when I first played it. Yeah. But it has this like really interesting action selection where like whichever action you pick, it kind of dictates which cards you're playing and the sh- how far your boat's going to move up this river. But then whichever action you take, that whole tile is going to shift down. 
and be like kind of weaker for for other people who want to take it. So again, it's another thing that just feels like innovative. And this game has more uh, tableau building, which almost reminded me of like a combination of some other games we'll talk about, like Oh My Goods and some of yeah. the uh, card games and everything. But but as of right now, this is the one that I want to revisit very soon. Like I'm, I feel like out of, I do want to get back to Blackout Hong Kong and Maracaibo, but I want to try Bloom Lake again soon. So I'm going to make that happen. Yeah, and yeah. Then yeah, I definitely will play it. And then you're like in the, the medium weight kind of area. We both have played and you have a video on Pirates of Maracaibo. We do with Alexander and Ralph. So That's they, awesome. Sorry, Alexander and Ryan, sorry. Ryan and um, Alexander were, were, were there playing. And they, they're really lovely. Alexander's really lively and then trying to uh, beat us. I think he won at the end. <laughs> but I, I can't remember. I really can't. I mean, winning is not really um, the thing. But, yeah, he's, he's really lively. It's really fun. I've played Pirates of Mario Cabo just recently as well. And I just proved that, you know, Alexander is, is a great designer. Yeah, yeah. And, and this one is co-designed with uh, Ralph. Bienert and Ryan and, Hendrickson. And Ryan, correct. Yeah, yeah. I and think it's like, they're, yeah, they're Ralph. They're, I think Ralph's. I think Ralph or Ryan. I think it was Ralph, uh, the one that is involved with Games Up, which is the co-publisher of Pirates of Maracaibo, besides the DLP games. Gotcha. Yeah, I wasn't sure like where, like who initiated the design of this one. But it's like it's definitely like takes some elements of Maracaibo, um, and it's way lighter than Maracaibo. Uh, yes. But I've only played it once with two players, and we both like really, really enjoyed it. Like the instead of having a oh. game board, you have a map of cards, so it's a yes. modular map setup. But you're still kind of moving your boat along, you know, past these cards, mm-hmm. and when one person gets to the end of the track um it kind of triggers the end of the round yeah that's right yeah it's and then you still have the explorer on the other side same with mario kaibo yeah Uh, there's like an exploration board that you're trying to advance on and i also yeah you it's probably more familiar with you because you've played it more recently than me but I also really liked the way the resources work, like where you're getting treasures, right? And you can, you when you get it. a treasure, it comes <laughs> to your player board. Yeah. But oh, to yeah. make it more valuable, you have to bury it, which is like a second yes. step. And also, yes. depending on the players are kind of controlling the market fluctuation, the value of each of the resources, which I really, yeah. like, I thought that was really oh, cool. Yes. So I, I really so like cool. Pirates America. I will. Yeah. The economic of that market manipulation is great. Like you can work with somebody or you can work on your own and but you have yeah. no options most of the time. And it's just that cards, those cards, it's just so great. It's this scarcity of, not scarcity, more like scarce of the cards being gone when somebody yeah. get there first. It's not just, you know. Yes, just yeah, you feel that. You want to get <laughs> Yeah. Yep. If you really you want to get to you a really card first skip. so you can take yeah, take yeah. advantage of something before other people. Yeah. You also can only move what up to four I think four cards. So you there are things that you yeah. can't get around. So make sure that if you want to get that one, this is your path. What can you do in between? And then what happens yeah. if this card is gone when someone else has takes it beha- before you? That's <laughs> just I think in I mean high play accounts it's more fun and more interactive rather than two players. I mean, if you like yeah. already in two players, that's great because then, you know, it's the same map and, you know, people, you, you it's not too tight. Like, okay, you can do your own thing. You can go up and the other one go down. But it's, and then four players, well, it's like all over the place. And when you go to another person's space, you have to pay to that person. And could oh, be like, yes, yes, yes. Oh, yeah, that just yeah. makes it more interact- interactive, yeah. Yeah, so I have been wanting to, like, revisit it with three or four to see how that feels. And I suspect, like you said, I'm going to probably like that a little bit more. But, yeah, we we enjoyed playing with two. And my partner, Matt, doesn't, like, love heavy games. 
So mm. this was like a real sweet. He also loves pirates. So I probably could have thrown a heavy pirate <laughs> game and he would have been like happy. Yes. Yeah. But but <laughs> this one, like he really, really liked. So it got the matte seal of approval. <laughs> oh, great. Uh, great. <laughs> yeah. And, and the, the other game that I feel like is in um, Alexander Fister's like more medium weight range is Cloud Age. And I've never played it. I, oh, no. I, so neither so did I. Neither did I. Yeah. So maybe we need to either. make sure we do that in the we next made, year, too. Yeah. Try it. Cloud Age. <laughs> I feel like that was one that kind of got lost in the shuffle. Like, I don't feel like I know many people who played it. Yeah, but I'm I'm still kind of curious about it. You know, they don't all have to be bangers, but it's still like <laughs> I tend to just enjoy Alexander Fister games. So I want to try this yeah. one at some point, too. I mean, they, they don't they don't have to be bangers, but because he's got such a high standard for us, so we compare yeah. his design with his other design, exactly. so it feels like less. <laughs> but, <laughs> but really, still, still a great like, game, really good. Yeah, exactly, exactly. We are comparing mm. within. <laughs> um, exactly. And then on the <laughs> on the lighter side, so I I know you mentioned you had never played Port Royal, but um, I haven't no. Port Royal is cool. I've only, I've, I think I've only played it like once, but it's this like push your luck pirate card game. And like the push your luck is like on your turn, you're drawing cards from the top of the deck. And if you ever reveal two ships that have the same color, you bust. But you're trying oh to push. Oh my gosh, I so want this game. You sh- <laughs> <laughs> you're trying to push so that you have more like different types of ships because you get to like pick up actually more cards or something like that. But I remember liking it, and I also kind of discovered that apparently there's a Port Royal the Dice game out there oh, that came out recently. Oh, wow. I, 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 I totally <laughs> did not notice that. I don't know how that is, but uh, Port Royal the card game is cool. Definitely worth checking out. I know uh, yeah. someone, I, uh, a friend of mine loves Port Royal, and I think, I think it definitely has an audience. I just never got it to the table all that much. Um, have you played Broom Service? I have, yeah, a while back. Have you? Yeah, I think this was my yeah. second Alexander Fister game. And this one was co-designed with Andreas uh, Pilakin. Yeah, uh, Pilakin. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, well, one more thing about Port Royal. I oh, think yeah. there is the big box coming out soon, or is that already come out? So Port Royal, the big box. Oh, maybe I do remember hearing right? about something like that. Yeah, yeah. So um, there you go. That'll be. I'll probably get it then. <laughs> oh yeah. When it comes to big box, it sounds like really. Because yeah, cool. I think it had like an expansion or something to it too. But now, like just yeah. talking about it is making me want to like revisit all of these games. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So do I. So we were talking about room service. It was a lot. Yeah. Game. It was kind of like very hot, very interactive. Kind of like push your luck. Whether you wanna, you wanna do the weak action or the strong action. And yeah, you never yeah. know. <laughs> I never know what's gonna happen. Uh, yeah, good old broom scene. I just remember. Yeah, I remember like liking this one a lot. I still own it. It's like yeah. you basically you're like moving your little witch around to deliver goods to castles. But the yes, the, the main mechanism of taking your actions is you're playing these cards from your hand, and but you have to pick if you're doing like each card has kind of a brave ability or a cowardly ability yeah yeah and that's so, it yeah, yeah and if, if you like let's say i'm first to play a card and i do the like collect resource action i don't remember what it's called but i do it cowardly i'll just immediately get whatever it says but if i instead i choose to do it brave the brave version then I have to wait and see if anybody else <laughs> plays that same action and if they yeah. pick brave they get to do it and I get denied. So it's like yes. high risk, high reward kind of thing. Like but if yeah, I am yeah, able yeah. to do it, you know, so you're like talking mm-hmm. to people at the table or trying to sense for what they might yes. be doing. But yeah, it's such a I, I had a very different yeah. feel. And I think it was, it's a co-design because it's like based on the other designer, Andreas yeah. Pelican's An previous game. game. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. Which is brutal. So that was, it's- yeah. It oh, was it's a really different game. Was Witches Brew? Okay. Yeah, Witches Brew. So it was just, I remember it, you know, there's the, like, I wouldn't say luck, like push your luck, yes, push your luck, but it's a light game. So you just got denied, but that's okay. You 
just a light game. Yeah. It's a fun game. We just laugh over it. It's just such a <laughs> exactly. one of those games. Yeah, exactly. that's, that's from Surface. Mm. And the other one is Isle of Sky. Yeah. Have you I this is another one like I play a uh, co-design same co-designer Andreas Pelican. Yeah. And yeah. uh I played it. I liked it. I just never got around to playing it more. Play it again. I played it as uh, well once. I think the auction mechanic was quite different, but what I know that I'm I'm actually struggling because it has me the the action sorry the auction is on the tile which is fine, but I have difficulties rotating things in my head so the spatial rotation ah, so that yeah. one of those like how do i know do i how do i know i'm gonna that i that want tile that tile or, tile or then, something yeah it's really yeah. hard for me in my brain to I have to grab it and put it and rotate it physically to know so that one yeah. is just it's like a tough one for me in for that regards I think I'm just not like the hugest kind of tile laying fan, but th yeah, this game for anyone who doesn't know, it's like a tile laying game where you have each game, you'll play with a set of like scoring tiles. So each game will be a little different, but you're kind of building out this mm -hmm. little town or something with these tiles that you're placing. Yeah. But the, but each round, I think you're auctioning off two tiles and you're like setting yeah. a price for them and other players can buy them. But if they don't buy them, like you have to buy it from yourself. You so you can't yeah. like set the price too high or something like that. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, like that I know twice. a lot of people think... who love it, but I I just haven't played it a whole lot. And I just, again, mm -hmm. I don't think I gravitate towards tiling. No, I, I think if it's, if the tile is, let's say the the tile is, replaced by like hypothetically is replaced by engine build card that probably something would be i would be playing more than mm. the tiles that i have to put and rotate and i have no idea how it's gonna yeah. look at the end without it, putting it <laughs> yeah yeah we, we align there because i think that's what it is for me too with like not yeah, yeah i don't know there's just something with yeah. the tiling but a lot of people yes. love it a lot of people yeah. love it oh you know, yeah I, it's a popular game. i would yeah, I definitely want to revisit that one at some point too. But Boon Lake, mm -hmm. I, th I think right now is still top on my revisit list as we talk. It's a revisit these. list. Yeah. Uh, the, the next one that I played is another co-design, and uh, it's called Tiber the Builder. And this is something I got years ago because Alexander Pfister's name was on it, and the yeah. co-designer is Dennis Rappel. And I had never played it until I went on a trip with my friend – Cassie and I was like I'm just gonna bring some card game that we can play at the airport because we had a layover and this is a game with multi-use cards and you're drafting them <laughs> and you're playing cards either as like a worker or as a builder and or as a citizen and different cards like I think depending on where you how you play them get placed different places and they you know represent resources and you're building up an engine it was really good. Like we both liked it a lot. We ended up playing like probably at least five times on that trip. And oh, wow. um, like really like even at a two player game, it was like very satisfying to draft the cards. And I think if I recall, you have different scoring cards or something that you can play with that kind of vary up each game. But mm -hmm. did you ever get a chance to play Tiber the Builder? No, 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 I haven't. It's just like I haven't got it. I haven't seen it in any of game shops as, as well either. So yeah. I haven't actually played that one. It's 2017 release. And it's, yeah, he's got so many games that I still wanna, <laughs> I, yeah, I want to play. I, I feel like I had to buy this one from someone on the geek market or something. I forget mm -hmm. how I got it, but it is a little bit more of a deep cut. And it also reminded me of the next game, Oh My Goods. Oh my goods! They didn't they change the mechanic from the first one that they released? I think. Uh, I don't I know. I know. Oh my Oof. goods has a lot of uh, like a few expansions. At some point, I bought them all, but I still have not played. Oh my goods! So this one's oh, like, like tableau it. building. Cards. Yeah, I know it's cards, Just cards. exactly. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but you're like you're chaining cards together to like kind of Correct. make a production engine or production engines or something yeah, like that. That's that's basically it. It's so fun. And then the multi-use cards, so the cards that you have, 
you can play it or you can discard it as resources. Um, I don't know if you played It's a Wonderful World. So you yes. can either take it, yeah, yeah. So or you can discard yeah. as resources, recycle it. I think it's called in there. Oh, and, cool. And you do you do chain that together. You're trying to get get worker and the worker will you do your production, yeah, to to get the building Produce running. Produce resources that you need to do this yep. thing with, kind yep, of. Yeah, and and the resources that they use is actually just cards face down. They just use some cards to. Put it face down Clever. as resources as well. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I love like that. I love using triple use cards. cards. And, yeah, <laughs> triple use cards. <laughs> and then, yes. yeah, I think the game you might have been thinking about is is it Expedition to New Dale? Like, this was That's, like a, ver- a new yeah. version of like, I don't know if it's a new version right. of Oh My Goods, but I know it shares some elements and it's like set in the same world. And this is like, this is more of a, that That's one's that. more of a medium. I think that would, the, Expedition to New Dale is like more of a complex game. Like I know it has like yes. this book that's different boards that like in a spiral mm-hmm. bound book or something like that. I used to own it at some point, but I never got it to the table and ended up selling it. Oh, uh, that's, I think that's the scenario. So there's just games or there's scenarios that you can do. It's basically like different variant, different variant plus plus adding different variant each time. But yeah, it is gotcha. based on all oh my goods the card game, but I'm pretty sure All My Goods has got a little tweak itself. And then there's Expedition to New Dale, which is using the All My Goods mechanic on, on the actual yeah. game where you can also explore the map. So that one, I, I remember enjoying that as well. Uh, that All My Goods make it a really unique one because just cards are used for everything and just yeah. like quick. I mean, it it then gets bigger because you just play cards everywhere, but still it's <laughs> kind of like in a small box. Always yeah. something about it, isn't it? Where it comes in a small box, picking up a punch. Big game. Oh my goods. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I know. That's cool. Um, the, the last one I would mention is a game that I just kind of, I remember, I think it like, I don't know if it came out in 2020 or around that time period where most exactly people 2020. Really getting- yeah. Oh yeah, okay. That that makes sense. Yeah. It's called Monster <laughs> Expedition, and it's this yes. like this push your luck dice game. And I, again, if if we're stacking it up against all of Alexander Fister games, it's not like my favorite one, but I thought it was like real fun and like I like the theme of it. It, it has push your luck again, which I'm noticing is another little trend. And this is like this is like one of those games like if I didn't have a uh, like a lot of games and this was like one of my like five or ten games, I would play it. I like it. You know, I like I remember liking it with the one time I played it, but I also <laughs> it's not like I'm not gonna say it's like my favorite Alexander Fister game. Yeah. It's cool. No, I haven't played this one as well. Now that I think that I, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure I haven't played it, but it's got dragon ish monster dragon. Probably more monster than dragon. <laughs> so you're sold. You're sold. <laughs> yeah, sold. And it's Alice, Alexander Fister. So what else? It, yeah, you just grab it and then play it. It, it, it exactly, exactly. And just, so I think we're we're noticing as we talk about these games. Definitely, there's a pirate theme. Here going, yeah. you know, with Port Royal, yeah. Maracaibo, Pirates of Maracaibo. But I found out because I was like, well, what was the first game that, you know, Alexander Fister has a credit on in BGG? And it it was back in 2008. There is a game <gasps> called Friar Buter der Karabek. And it's, <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to pronounce yeah. it. Sorry. But uh, I have no idea. But it, but it's like it it is some game that's a that's used off some game console called Yvio Y V I O. Um, mm. I don't know, but it's a pirate <laughs> game that Alexander Fister oh designed God. from 2008. <laughs> so this is pre Maracaibo action oh. here. <laughs> oh, pre Port is, Royal. Is oh, yeah, pre Graverson Trail. <laughs> He's got the thing for pirates. I'm surprised that Graverson Trail is not pirate. Maybe it is going to be a retheme of pirates. Graverson oh, Trail, my goodness. <laughs> my mind just blew for a second when you said that. That would be wild. That would be oh so gosh, wild to have a pirate themed Great Western Trail. <laughs> <laughs> right, but anyway, right? like that's like I think like I think interesting fact. Mm. Yeah, like overall, just again, Alexander Fister's designs are just they just feel so unique and fresh. 
And it's kind of cool to just like, or at least I enjoyed, <laughs> like just talking about some of these games, even ever so briefly, even if it's something we haven't played in a while, just because it's like making me realize how much I appreciate him as a designer. Mm -hmm. And it's also making me want to play all of these games again, but Boon Lake first is Boon Lake is going to be first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's it. Oh, uh, well, well, let you, let me know how it goes. See if uh, I'm going to like it. Yeah, or not. you too. That's... If you if yeah. you get yeah, whenever you get to play it, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. But it, the next thing is pretty funny because so Stella and I were going to come up with our like favorite Alexander Fister games, and we just kind of mm -hmm. put together a top three but it turns out like we almost 100 percent aligned so uh yeah. we'll kind of just i'll let you start with your your number three <laughs> well now that you asked me that my number three <laughs> is pirates of maracaibo oh, oh nice my gosh yes so this is the medium level game that we talked about earlier this is yep. just released in 2023 i picked it up at essence spiel we talk about who designed it with alexander fista and why this is on my number three is because of the scarcity of the cards especially in higher player accounts again i've mentioned this mm. before because yeah. the cards that you want for your engine build, and by the way, this is for engine build and scoring points as well, and could be end of game points and could be actions. Now that's scarcity on that card. They could be gone in just like a turn. You gotta just grab it. But then again, as we discuss the slow or fast movement, the cards that you want might be all the way at the front. You might move faster and do you really want to move faster or do you want to just slow and then gain the cards that you want along the way so yeah. oh my gosh that is and the variety of action cards the smooth action the you know the smooth. the game scoring that's a great smooth. way to describe oh my gosh it's, yeah a lot of these games really, are smooth they feel smooth yes yeah. yes it's like professionally designed and the game scoring is actually different than Maracaibo. now in Maracaibo. Right. You have that thing as well on the player board and you move it uh, kind of like from your player board to the main board while this is the other way around. It's not really the other way around, but you have a, a supply of uh, cubes and you put it on your board to upgrade your right. engine. Uh, it's actually double layer player board on Pirates of Maracaibo. So they help with not moving around and they're not knocked over like in Maracaibo. I don't know. I play the Maracaibo version where there's no dual layer player board or is it always dual layer, not dual layer player board? I don't, I don't remember. I don't think I so. don't remember either. But what, yes. but what I do like about Pirates <laughs> of Maracaibo is those, the, the top, the front and the back of the ships tile that you can add to your ship, right? Oh my gosh, yeah. The the sh the, he the head, the ship head, that's part of an engine build. Yeah. Yeah. That's so clever. Yeah. That's so fun. It is. It is because it gives you some like little special ability or something. Yeah. So that's that's why Pirates of My Cabo is my number three. How about your number three, Candice? Okay. So my number three is tough because... I feel like everything that I would consider, like I knew my number one and my number two and yeah. you did too. And we aligned yes. 100%. And here we basically sort of aligned because I was like torn between Maracaibo and Pirates of Maracaibo because I honestly okay. still have not played either of them, either of them enough. And I also haven't played Boone Lake enough. So I don't know. So this, this is a big <laughs> kind of question mark, but I did put down Pir or Maracaibo and Pirates of Maracaibo. And I, you know, we'll have to circle back in a year and see which one of those two yeah. that I enjoy more or if Boon Lake kind of sweeps up here. Who knows? I don't know. But for like all those same reasons as you, like the the reason we love a lot of these games, like the the movement, the yeah. scarcity of like mm -hmm. being the not getting somewhere first, um, all the different upgrades that you can do to kind of build up your engine like. I really, you know, and it, it's so funny because at the time that I made this list, I was thinking that like, I want to revisit Maracaibo first. And, but yeah. now I don't know. I'm still like feeling Boone Lake. So we'll, we'll see. Mm -hmm. We'll see. 
One leg it is, one leg, yeah. But then our number two, because we synergized 100% here, both of us <laughs> had Sky Mines as our number two. Ooh. And this is one of the heavier releases came out in 2022, re-implementation mm-hmm. of Mombasa, which I think maybe was 2015. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It's designed by Alexander Fister with Victor Kobolk. And Kobolk? it's published... Kobolk? Yeah. Kabuk? Yeah. Uh, it's published by Deep Print Games and Pegasus Spiele. It plays with one to four players. And, yep. you know, this is a game where you're basically where investors trying to earn the most uh, crypt coin from mining on the moon. And mm. what what I love about it is the uh, the card programming and the hand management I find to be, like, brilliant and I love how it also fuses in deck building. I love deck building. There's some worker placement in there. So there's like, you know, you want to talk about scarcity. Like what is the timing to go to one of those spaces that lets you oh, cash yes. in on having the max of a certain resource? And then even more importantly, I love market manipulation. And this game has like yeah. really cool market manipulation. Yeah, oh, so yes. Sky Mines is like so good, and I I want to explore the like some of those new modules and stuff soon. But um, why did you have it as your number two? Well, similar to you, I guess the market manipulation or the economic part. It's kind of like a little bit like parts of Mario Cowboy as well. There's that as well, and there's lots and lots of hard decision. The hand management is brilliant. The programming of the yeah. card is like like at Hong Kong's right, and you have to yeah. uh, play certain things, and you wanna which one you wanna do first. It's very critical. There are actions that that is better when you have the cards face up but you want when you want to face face it down and do that action and then potentially lose in that more powerful action it's like to right. not lose the action that you need before the opponent gets it oh my gosh it's just like it's amazing amazing game right um, yeah engine yeah. building and then there's yeah the engine building part and there's player interaction kind of like oh oh yeah definitely definitely and there's this what do you call that thing? You, you're you trying to build um, thing on your player board and you need to have the resources to advance on the track. And oh, yes. I yeah, like, like the, the helium is... track. The yes, helium track so that used to be the diamond track. Yeah. Yes, like most of them, you just have to have it. You don't have to give up on the resources. I think that's so clever. I'm like, yeah. Oh my gosh, what and is the that? research like, track. No. So there, there are two different tracks <laughs> yeah. that you're – you're working on and it's like yeah do you want to like lean really heavy into one one game like there's so many different paths to victory so i think oh gosh yes yes classic alexander fister classic and that market manipulation that you say on the board wow i'm like it's very interactive it's just on the board building the the company what there are four companies i think on on, yeah there are four of them and it's like, yeah. you know, may- maybe I see two other players are really pushing up the value of something. Yeah. So then I'm like, oh, I better move up that track. I better, yeah. you know, take the actions I need to move up that track. Yeah, it's yep. it's such a cool, cool design. So cool. And that's our number two. And number one. Number one, Candice. Number one is wow. the whole Great Western Trail trilogy. Oh, my gosh, Yes. <laughs> I love it. I just just so love it. It's just so so many many ways to play this one. Like the building, we're talking about first the base game, maybe the one that people are most familiar with, right? The building, like even the buildings are different each game. And then do yeah. you want to focus which workers you want to have? You want to focus on advancing your train further on the track. Like yeah. you know, yeah. Like where to, where people on- place which buildings is yeah. It's, I know. Like, it just changes up every game. I swear, the first time I heard about the Great Western Trail Argentina, I was like, and me and Taryn, especially Taryn, was like, what else could be different? What else? It's basically the same game. And then I'm like, <laughs> right. I convinced Taryn to like, let's just get it. You know, we, we enjoy it so much. We like, you know, we just play it. It's like playing Great Western Trail, right? I'm like. And Taryn was like, sure. And then I got it and then we <laughs> play it. I'm like, oh my God, it's his favorite. Great Western Trail is the Argentina one. It's still okay. different, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's that's one of the things like I like about this whole trilogy is that 
every game feels like Great Western Trail, but they all feel different from each other. Like Argentina adds like a new type of a fourth type of worker, and it yes. also introduces grain as an additional resource. And then and you, can, you have like the yeah. ships. And you can have shortcuts for deliveries and the, like the city oh my maps gosh, that yes. you're delivering to these ports and stuff. And it's like, but it's still like, it feels like Great Western Trail, you know, but it's, yes. it's different. And it kind of like presents new challenges. And then last year we got New Zealand. Oh my and, gosh. Oh, yes. even, even cooler. So right now, what would you say? What mm-hmm. do you, is New Zealand your favorite? My, yeah, my number one out of the Great Western Trail is... New Zealand, number one, is the deck building. It's more heavily the back deck building. And I love my deck building. So surely <laughs> when this one was like, oh, yeah. It was just like, oh, my God. It's like you can play so many cards in one turn. I'm like, okay. Yeah. You just like draw more cards. You play this. I'm like, yes, this. And then you got lots lots of more money. But then you have to pay more like on the shipping, which is great. So mm, New Zealand. Yeah. Yours as well? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. I, it's like <laughs> one of those so. things like I'm afraid it's... to like say that I like one child better than the other if I had children oh, or I know. whatever. Oh my but, gosh. <laughs> but it, it it's it's hard. Like I feel like I need to play them all like 50, 50 more times and then I'll be able to mm-hmm. like say which one is my favorite. But I I really do love New I think right now New Zealand is my favorite because of what you're saying. Like it ha- like the mm-hmm. deck building choices and like your hand management is so much different and like even like more interesting, I think, in New Zealand. And then um also I like the the sea roots board. Like, you know, that's another thing. Like, do I wanna go heavy exploring on the sea route? And like that kind of yeah. reminds me of the rails so to the north expansion. Yeah, and get, yeah. The, get oh, those yeah. houses. Get those houses out. I love that you have that. Um, what is that track? That like Pathfinder track that you can go up. Yes, the, and yeah, unlock the birds abilities. One. Yep. And yep. I, I just, yeah, I just love that all three of the games have this. They feel like what I love about Great Western Trail, but then they also <laughs> feel different enough that um, it's worth it to have them all in oh, my yeah. collection. In your you collection. Know? That's absolutely yeah. right. I mean. All this, like, I think the New Zealand is a little bit more complex than Argentina, and Argentina is a little bit more complex than the base game as well. So it gets more and more complex. But hey, it's fine. We are uh, we're ready for that. And um, yeah, it's still a different game, still a different feels. The feeling is it the same yet different. It's like oh, um, oh, you like ice cream? You you like vanilla ice cream? How about vanilla ice cream mixed with chocolate? Ooh, it's so good. <laughs> different vanilla ice cream with strawberry. Oh yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same but different flavor. Oh my gosh! Yep. I don't know. I feel like ice cream. Yep. We <laughs> it's we hot love here. ice cream. That <laughs> that's the message here. We love ice cream. Yeah, but that's yeah, it. this in is summary. <laughs> but this this and like sky mines are just like I feel like just such examples of why I think Alexander Fister is such a great designer and like mm. they just these games just don't feel like anything else. Like they're just. I don't know. They're Alexander Pfister games, you know, like it I just, there, there's something that feels so satisfying and so challenging yeah. about them at the same yes. time. And um, yeah, they're not only just like Sky Mines and Great Western Trail, like not only my favorite Alexander Pfister games, but mm-hmm. like some of my like favorite games, you know, if we're going to get yeah. into a top whatever list, like I love oh, yes. these games, yep. you know? Yes, definitely. Definitely. It's like the, Day I found out that Great Western Trail is on board game arena. I'm like, Taryn, let's start a game. And then we've just been playing, I don't know how many games now. Just <laughs> every ongoing day. And then start a game. I love that. Yes. I, yes. I love that. It's like, I love that. <laughs> we, like, what I like about board game arena is that it's quick and it's between other things. Yes. And also, you give it gives you, all right, if you play, you sit down with a few friends, you're playing games. You kind of like okay, you oh you want to try this strategy, but then in board game arena because it's that quick, it entices you to do different things each yeah. game, and then you know yeah. that you can just okay this this doesn't work, you can just start another try game, try something out and next then, time, yeah, and play yeah, it pretty fast. yeah, 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 yeah. Although I want probably I would need to have the game physically before jumping to board game arena, but it's just my thing. 
Um, I feel like. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how that would exact. I know what you mean. I know what you mean because I played. Yeah. Um, uh, what is the game? Madeira on. I've I've never played the physical board game of Madeira, but I played it on yeah. Board Game Arena, and I found it like very challenging where i think if i had played the board game first it would have been like yeah easier to kind of get into yeah. the digital adaptation mm. of it you know yes 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 that's exactly why oh i duration um i remember playing a game that we haven't got and we just a little bit more confusing because you look yeah. at the rule book and then you imagine it like physically and so we play that and like yeah whatever and we play the physical game oh wow and then we play it back again to board game arena yeah. and then we love it yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Like, uh, I, I agree. I'm mm. I'm with you there where like I feel like some board game arena games are easier to grok after you've actually played the physical version. Yeah. Yeah. But uh but while while parts of Mario Kaibo is not on board game arena, Mario Kaibo is on board game arena. So it's something oh, that I'll mm. that's good to know. Yeah. That is yeah. good to know. Um, I, mean, I have to get a game that... going, Stella. <laughs> oh, I know Candice. If you're on Gordon Karima, <laughs> hit me up. Hit me up there. I, 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 am, I actually don't play on there that often, but um That's all right. I should. Yeah. I should take advantage of like all Oh, the I used I used to not there. I used to not play that often, but it's just that recently I found that the the usefulness and the you know waiting is like what I'm gonna play mobile app. No, I've got Borgia Marina on my iPad and just like playing that. And yeah. like we've been yeah. playing the crew. It's like like almost the mission, it's like th- mission 38, something like that. We keep going, oh. playing the crew, me and Tarrant on board game arena and missions of the missions up to that, that much. Cool. <laughs> it's great. Yes. That's it's, awesome. Um, That's awesome. But yeah, back again to Alex and the Fisa. Wow. Great. It was in trial. <laughs> That's it. Like um, no yeah. one, no one, bit, nothing beats Alex and the Fisa's. Like if he's competing himself, nothing beats that. <laughs> great Western trial. New yeah. Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> New Zealand, Great Western Trail, New Zealand. Yeah, all uh, love Great Western Trail. But Stella, I'm so glad you picked this topic because I mean, it gave us both the opportunity to kind of like geek out about Alexander Fisher and his health, games. Sure. Yeah. And it seriously has lit a fire, uh, a revisit Boon Lake fire under my butt. So mm. I am going <laughs> to get on that because. Yeah, now I'm like, I don't know. I've just been like, ever since I st- we've been talking about this episode, I've been like thinking about, ooh, I want to play Boon Lake again. And I know yeah. there's an expansion for it. I don't know what it adds or anything, but yeah, I- I'm going to revisit it. And I'm, d- I'm glad you picked this topic. And it was just great talking to you. And I already can't wait to bump into you a million times. Are you going to be at Gen Con? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity to geek out and talk about this topic or choose this topic as well. And yes, I am planning to be at Gen Con. So I guess I we'll don't have to a make appointment. Times. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure we'll be <laughs> like, oh, yeah, Candice. Yeah, I, I'll expect that to happen. If I don't see you, I'll be really surprised. <gasps> I know. Just like, be yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so definitely we'll see you then. <laughs> awesome. Well, enjoy the rest of your day and thanks again for joining, Stella. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much, Candy. This was fun. Thank you. You've been listening to the Board Game Geek Podcast, produced and edited by Candace Harris. Special thanks to Matt Fonda for editing and mixing our music. Be sure to visit us on the web at boardgamegeek.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Twitter, Blue Sky, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Twitch under Board Game Geek. You can reach us by email at podcast at Thanks for listening and happy gaming.